my water just broke. I felt like things really intensified. She was right there and she was coming. It was, it was an amazing feeling. I'm gonna cry just thinking about it. I could feel her head. We heard her cry. We were squeezing hands and she was screaming. <laughs> I'm Bryn Hunt Palmer and you're listening to The Birth Hour. This podcast is designed as a safe place to come together and share childbirth stories. Stick around and join us to hear informative and empowering birth journeys from all over the world. Today's episode is sponsored by Babylist. The people at Babylist believe that you should be able to get exactly what you need for your unique and growing family. That's why their baby registry easily lets you add any item from any store. Plus, Babylist helps you each step of the way with their customized checklist, product guides, and reviews. And their personal registry consultants are there for you whenever you need. They've even got group gifting. Start your registry today to be eligible for a free Hello Baby box of goodies for baby worth over $100 while boxes last. At the end of this episode, I'll be talking to Ashley all about Babylist and what she loves most about using their service. If you're new to the birth hour, you may not know that we have a Patreon group. This is where listener supporters can pledge $5 or more a month to help support the birth hour and its mission. If the birth hour has added to your life in some way, we would love for you to consider supporting us by going to patreon.com slash birth hour. All of our listener supporters have access to bonus content, as well as an exclusive Facebook group created just for you. The members of that group are so amazing, and the support we give one another there has had such an impact on my life, and I know it has for so many others who find our group to be a safe place to ask questions, share concerns, and get genuine and loving feedback from those who have been where they are or are going through something similar. We also do regular Zoom calls in there as well. So again, if you head over to patreon.com slash birth hour, you can get started and show your support for the birth hour. I will link to that right in the podcast app show notes as well. And you'll be able to see all the different perks you get at the different levels, including our co-producer level, which is $10 a month and comes with access to our second podcast, the partner podcast, where my husband interviews partners about their perspective on pregnancy, birth, and postpartum. That podcast comes out every single Friday for our co-producers via Patreon. So again, head over to patreon.com slash birth hour, and we would love to have your support. Today's birth story guest is Lauren, and she's going to be sharing two birth stories. One was with a preterm baby, and then the other was a high-risk pregnancy for gestational diabetes. So let's hear Lauren's stories now. Hi, Lauren. Welcome to the birth hour. Thanks for coming on the podcast today. Thank you for having me. Can you tell listeners a little bit about you and your family? Sure. I live in the Lehigh Valley area of Pennsylvania with my husband, Steve, and my kids, Charlotte, who just turned six, and Madeline, who just turned three. And I'm a college professor, and I teach and research about child development. All right. And we're going to hear both stories today. So let's start with your first pregnancy. Anything you want to share from getting pregnant and how your pregnancy went? Sure. I'll start by talking about Charlotte's story. I got pregnant with Charlotte when I was 34 years old, and I thought initially that I would just be casual about it and, you know, not track and everything and realize quickly after the first cycle that I'm detail oriented enough that I wanted all the data. (laughs) And so the second cycle I started charting um, and then the third cycle uh, got pregnant. I really learned to use the ovulation predictor strips that test for um, luteinizing hormone, the uh, LH hormone. And I actually used two forms of ovulation strips. I used the like little cheapy ones you can get on Amazon to test every day when I thought I was approaching my fertile period. And then when the LH line started getting dark or when I knew by the day that ovulation was getting close, I switched to the clear blue advance. And so that's the type that has the blinking smiley when estrogen starts rising and then the solid smiley when your um, luteinizing hormone peak. And so as somebody who loves data, I loved having the two types of strips telling me the same thing. (laughs) Yeah. And the ones that are just the like line, it's like you're overanalyzing every little shade of the color. Exactly. Right. And so I I love that the clear blue advance gives you the blinking smiley when estrogen starts peaking, which happens before LH happens. Mm -hmm. So I always knew when I got the blinky smiley, okay, you know, we're, we're getting there. It's like, it's getting close. I absolutely loved getting all the data about my body. And from a feminist perspective, really think that uh, that women need to be taught those things earlier in our life. It wasn't until I wanted to have a baby that I learned so much about my cycle. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think it's super interesting and fascinating and, and something that every teenage girl should learn also. 
So I got pregnant with Charlotte on my third cycle and I got my positive test uh, with her at 12 days post ovulation, woke up feeling like a little woozy and funny. And then my temperature was a little bit higher. I was tracking my temperature also and went, hmm, maybe there's something happening here. And sure enough, after I tested, there was like a super faint line, so faint that my husband had already left for the morning and I had to call him two minutes after he left and say, oh my gosh, something popped up. So once it kind of sunk in that you were pregnant, how did you feel both, you know, early pregnancy and then throughout the rest of your pregnancy? I felt great. I loved being pregnant both times. The great feeling with my first pregnancy with Charlotte was somewhat tempered initially by uh, we got some scary test results with the prenatal screening, the test that measures the neck, nuchal fold measurement. That's what it was. I got that since I was going to be 35 by the time she was born and went in thinking, you know, okay, this, you know, this is great. We could see our baby and then went out being told that based on that measurement of the nuchal fold, as well as they thought she had a two vessel cord a single umbilical artery. So they thought she didn't actually end up having it, but they thought at that point that she did. And so I came out of that appointment being told there was a one out of three chance that she had some sort of chromosomal abnormality. And so that had us shaking in our boots for about five or six days. At that appointment where they gave us that news, they took the blood draw for the non-invasive prenatal testing where they look at the baby's DNA in the mom's blood And while we were waiting for those results to come back, that was just one of the scariest, most stressful times that we had ever experienced together, not knowing what we were going to do depending on how those came out. We worked with a great genetic counselor who, when she got the results, she called me right away. And I'll never forget, the first thing she said is, I'm calling with good news. Mm. That's side manner right there. Exactly. <laughs> she didn't say the result of the test. She just said what the conclusion was the first time I picked up the phone. That was wonderful and such a relief. So that was the first kind of milestone of her pregnancy that marked it initially with stress and anxiety that turned out to be unnecessary after we got the non-invasive prenatal testing results. But And that actually informed some decisions that we made with my second pregnancy about the timing of when to do those prenatal tests. The other thing that happened with my pregnancy with Charlotte, I was uh, diagnosed with gestational diabetes. And I actually, I knew that I was at risk of that. And so I actually had been monitoring my fasting blood sugar kind of leading up into like, you know, 20, 24 weeks. And I could actually see it come on. I could see my fasting blood sugar start to go up after about 24 weeks. So I was not surprised when that came back positive for gestational diabetes, but I was able to manage that with diet and exercise pretty effectively. And we were able to go to on a baby moon to Hawaii when I was 27 weeks pregnant, highly recommended. And I felt really good throughout my whole pregnancy. I exercised and I loved being pregnant, felt really positive about my body and loved that time. Let's go ahead and and talk about how labor started for you and what your birth looked like. Sure. Charlotte's story is a bit unusual because she was a late preterm birth. Uh, She was born at 34 weeks. And so at about 34 and a half weeks, I woke up one morning with some bleeding. It kept happening throughout the day. So I went in later that day to get checked out. If the office had been open, I would have gone in there, but it was a Sunday. So I had to go in the labor and delivery unit. When I got there, they put me on the fetal monitor and they said, oh, do you feel those contractions you're having every three minutes? And I said, what? What contractions? And I felt cramps a little bit, but they did not feel like what I expected contractions to feel like. And then when they noticed I was having contractions, they said, well, would you mind if we do a cervical check? So I consented to that. And then I was surprised to be three centimeters dilated already. So that was quite a surprise, not something that we had anticipated or were thinking would happen at all. And so they admitted me to the hospital just for observation overnight. And I got a horrible night's sleep (laughs) because they did non-stress tests every hour. So that was awful. The hospital bed was uncomfortable. And by about 5 or 6 a.m., I woke up and I couldn't sleep any longer and just had a horrible night's sleep. I started noticing that crampy feeling more and more. And the hospital staff didn't really realize I was in labor. I knew I was in labor earlier than they knew. I knew by about late afternoon that I wasn't going home. By late afternoon, they kept talking about, well, we'll check you later this evening when you've been here 24 hours. Maybe you'll go home. You'll be pregnant for another couple of weeks and she'll be born at full term. And by, you know, one one or two o'clock in the afternoon, I'm like, I'm not going home. But it was my sense that the medical staff didn't believe me. You know, I kept saying, I don't think that's going to happen. And I just didn't think that they were believing what I was saying about my own body. So that was frustrating. 
I intentionally made the decision, though, not to try to convince them or show them how they were wrong because they were leaving me alone. (laughs) And they were basically letting me labor like I would at home. You know, I could get up and move around. My husband uh, went home and got the yoga ball. I was making phone calls to my mom and friends and people to kind of, you know, talk through and have a little bit of company. I was getting through it and it was fine. So it was actually a great place to do early labor with what I knew was going to be a preterm baby because I was right there in the hospital. I had medical attention, but they weren't really treating me like a patient in labor yet. And that turned out to be an unexpected benefit. So at about 7 p.m., which I now realize is shift change, which was a bad time to do it, but at about 7 p.m., I asked them to check me again. And it was very clear to me I was in labor, that then I was six centimeters. And then they went, oh, okay, I guess you're in labor. And I went, yeah, I, I, I know. <laughs> And they admitted me to labor and delivery. And because they had, you know, been with me the whole afternoon, it was apparent that, you know, I was into natural childbirth, even with a preterm baby that I wanted to go as natural as I could. I would highly recommend a doula. I called my doula that afternoon and she, I think it was her actually who gave me the advice that like, hey, they're leaving you alone, (laughs) you know, just like let them leave you alone. And when I got admitted to labor and delivery, I called my doula. She um, came right away as soon as she could. And I had a great nurse who liked natural labor. Labor. I think putting the pieces together, having heard so many birth stories now, I think probably what happened is my nurse in the observational unit probably handpicked a nurse who liked natural labor because she knew me as a patient already. I don't know that that happened. I'm just kind of filling in the gaps. It doesn't seem like chance that I got such a great nurse who liked uh, natural labor. So she was wonderful. At one point, my nurse was on the floor on her hands and knees under me holding the fetal monitor on as I was going through a contraction because I wanted to like lean over the bed or something like that. And it's not every nurse that you get who goes to those kind of lengths to respect her patient's birthing preferences while also getting the doctors the monitoring data that they want. Mm -hmm. And so she was fantastic. I really, I really appreciated her. Her name was Sheila. So that was great. She it was really supportive. My doula was wonderful. My husband was wonderful. And by about 11 p.m., I started really getting tired. I hadn't slept well the night before. I'd been up for 18 hours, laboring for the whole day. And although I didn't want an epidural, I, I requested an epidural at that time, not for pain. I was coping really well, but because I was tired. I was six, seven centimeters and imagining I've got to get through the rest of labor and then have the energy to push and I'm going to need some rest. And so I requested the epidural And while we were waiting for the anesthesiologist to come, I said, well, you know, while I can get out of bed, let me just go ahead and get out of bed while I can. And right when I got up, my water broke dramatically and my doula had to jump out of the way to avoid her shoes getting splashed. And, you know, it was like out of the movies, the water breaking. And labor moved really fast from there. My doula was wonderful in explaining to me right away because she knew of my desire to know what was going on, that I didn't have any cushion anymore. The water wasn't cushioning anything in the uterus anymore. And she did a progressive relaxation exercise with me that I had done throughout prenatal yoga with her. And that really helped me just kind of get back to that calm place in the aftermath of my water breaking so dramatically. Within about 10, 15 minutes after my water broke, it was apparent that I was starting to feel pushy and starting to feel pressure. And one of the residents came in and checked me and found that I was fully dilated at 1210, just after midnight. So that's 20 minutes after my water broke. So I went from seven centimeters to 10 centimeters very quickly. And the residents and the nurse knew that I wanted a natural labor anyway, and they knew that I had requested for the epidural, but here I am, I'm fully dilated. This is great. You know, I obviously had that burst of energy in all the excitement of my water breaking so suddenly. And so I remember the resident said to me, you could get an epidural if you wanted to, but why don't you just do it? (laughs) You know, you're you're right here. And so then I had to wait for the doctor to get there, panting through contractions. And the resident was really great. I wish that she had been the one to deliver my baby because she had been so encouraging. I was admitted The doctor came in and there were lots of people in the room because, again, she was a 34-weeker. They knew she was likely to need some help right after birth. And the doctor came in. I pushed for six minutes. I think it was about three pushes. And she was out. And it was incredible. That's amazing. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. 
And so this is about half an hour after I said, oh, I'm seven centimeters. I think I want an epidural. Yeah. That transition is... Exactly. It's real. (laughs) It is real and it was intense. Yeah. I remember Charlotte being born. I remember, you know, looking down and seeing her as she was being born and the doctor was pulling her out. She was so alert and she was just looking all around. And I tell her now when I tell her about her birth story, it was just looking around like, what is this? What is going on? (laughs) And she was super alert, which was really comforting and wonderful since, again, I knew she was a preemie. The NICU team rushed her over. And like what the genetic counselor had said to me in framing the results positively right away, one of the things that I remember they said, which was so helpful at the time, is, you know, they rushed her over and I didn't think I was going to get choked up, but here I am. Mm. They rushed her over and I said, is she okay? Is she okay? And they they said, "Um, we're just helping her breathe. So that's such a difference. They could have said she's having trouble breathing. Mm -hmm. Um, but they said, we're helping her breathe. And the the difference between, if they had said she's having trouble breathing, I would have panicked. But they said, we're helping her breathe. And that made all the difference. Mm. I'm going to take a minute. Yeah. (laughs) I t- I've told this story so many times. I don't know why I'm getting... Um... That's such a meaningful detail, though. I love that that stuck with you. Yeah. Um, so my husband rushed uh, with the NICU team to the NICU. He stayed with her for a little bit. He texted me a picture of her. Um, and my doula and my my great nurse stayed with me to deliver the placenta and everything. I don't remember much of that. I really don't even remember delivering the placenta, honestly. I remember asking to see it and they brought it over in the container and being a scientist and an intellectually curious person, I remember saying, that's so cool. (laughs) And everybody in the room laughed, but it really is amazing. Like I am amazed at what our bodies do when, when we're pregnant. After a little bit, my husband came back from the NICU and when I got all cleaned up and ready, I went up to the NICU with him and we have a couple little videos and pictures of me meeting her, which are just lovely and I wish we had more of them. And after she started getting sleepy, I put her back in her isolate and got set up in my mother baby room. And all this time, it had not occurred to me, nor had anybody suggested, oh, you might want to pump. <laughs> Or as I was holding her in the NICU, oh, you know, why don't you put her skin to skin? Like nobody had suggested that. And I was a first time mom, although I knew intellectually that I should do those things. It didn't occur to me in that moment. So I was the one who had to ask once I realized, oh, I need to pump. You know, she was born four hours ago. Why has nobody brought me a breast pump? And uh, there wasn't really adequate instruction. It was in the middle of the night. There wasn't really adequate instruction on how to pump. And so I was just figuring that out all on my own. The day shift when they got there a few hours later was a little bit better, but learning to nurse was hard um, and learning to pump was hard. She had been born just after midnight. So I got kind of an extra night in the hospital because <laughs> that first night basically didn't count. So that was lovely. I got I got an extra night of what they usually would give for a vaginal birth and I had to go home while Charlotte stayed in the NICU. And this was an intense time. I feel like we have a birth story and then we have a NICU story for her. NICU moms can relate to. Yeah. I have since realized that feminist indignant rage is one of my postpartum symptoms. <laughs> mm. Specific. <laughs> I kind of experienced that with my second as well, but it's just, you know, the, the rush of hormones and it's intense time. And then, you know, I just got extra worked up and extra mad about things that I thought could be better for moms and babies. So um, I, individually, our NICU staff was great. The lactation consultants in the hospital were great. Individual people were great, but the system could use some help. <laughs> at least it could have at that time. I think it's a little bit better Now, this was six years ago, but for instance, there wasn't a place for postpartum moms to rest. I went home, I got discharged, I didn't have a room. Um, We lived 30 minutes away from the hospital. When we come to see her at the NICU every day, we could see her at her care times of 12, 3, 6, and 9 around the clock. But what am I going to do between those times? I was welcome to hang out in her space within the NICU, but it was small. It was busy. There were alarms everywhere and noises. It wasn't very restful. And so we did things like 
went to the car in the parking lot and laid the seat down to like take a nap in the car between times when we could see my NICU baby. Um, I did things like laid down in the cafeteria booth, brought my eye mask and laid down in the cafeteria booth to rest. You know, and here I am four days postpartum and that's how I have to rest. That's not okay. Not, it's not okay. So again, individual people were wonderful, but the system needs to be better. Mm -hmm. It's an intense time. One thing that I found people didn't understand about being a NICU mom is that, yeah, I didn't bring a baby home, but we're running back and forth from the hospital all day. Mm -hmm. She was born early, so we had like work stuff to wrap up (laughs) and, you know, get to a stopping place. There was still a lot to do, and it was still an intense time. I, I wasn't sleeping through the night because I was still waking up every two to three hours to pump around the clock. So it, w- it was really intense and something that I think the average person who hasn't had a NICU experience doesn't quite understand. So how many days total was she in the NICU? She was in the NICU for 23 days okay. and came home after that. And so she came home right around what would have been 38 weeks, 38 weeks and a couple of days. In the end, we stayed overnight to get her home. I was gradually realizing as she as she got to be, as she started to be able to regulate her temperature, as she started to be able to wake up on her own and and signal to be fed, I was starting to realize how the NICU schedule was not fitting her. When she was a sleepy 35-week-old, we had to wake her up to eat. And even then, sometimes they had to put you know milk down the tube, down her feeding tube, because she was just too sleepy to eat. As she as she approached full term age. Age, she kind of woke up and it started to become apparent to me that this NICU schedule of we're going to feed and take care of your baby at 12, 3, and 6, and 9 around the clock is not fitting her needs. There were times when we would get there in the morning and say, and they would say, oh yeah, she was, you know, she was really, really crying and really, you know, really hungry by the time her nine o'clock care time came around. Again, postpartum rage is one of my <laughs> symptoms. And so I go, why didn't you feed her then? You know, like I wasn't here. Why weren't you feeding? You have a refrigerator full of milk. If she were home, I would be feeding her on demand. The thing that was keeping her in the hospital in the end was she needed to gain adequate enough weight. And here they are putting her on this every three hour schedule that was clearly not meeting her needs. And so in the end, we stayed overnight a couple of nights where um, I fed her on demand. um, And that was thanks to uh, a suggestion of a breastfeeding friendly NICU nurse who indicated that that was possible, um, that if I was there, I could feed her when I wanted, but they could only feed her at at those specific times. Or, I, I mean, I guess they, they could, if she was really crying and really, you know, worked up, they would move it up. But, but still, like, like, why does she have to get so upset and crying out for food before they feed her before her time, right? That's not how I would treat a full-term baby. Why are we treating a baby who's aging into their full term in the NICU like that? Um, and so once I once I stayed home, fed her on demand, she sailed over the bar of her weight requirements for what she needed um, to come home. And I ended up partially because of all that pumping initially, um, I got lots of milk. I had a, a really big oversupply in the end. I looked back to some of my early logs and I was uh, producing basically enough for twins. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I was I was like feeding her and then I had a whole like 40 ounces left over per day. Wow. And so I had lots of milk and being an overachiever, <laughs> um, I, d- I could have cut down the pumping, but the just that NICU mindset of like, you know, are you going to have enough milk? And like, it just got into my head and I didn't want to cut down pumping early on because I know if you cut down early on, sometimes it's harder to get it back. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I just kept up more of a pumping schedule than I really needed to and started freezing milk. Um, I donated milk. I donated uh, 4,000 ounces over two years to the Mother's Bank Northeast, which was wonderful. And I donated the first time uh, when she was three months old, and I was able to donate uh, preemie milk, which is really yeah. valuable. Mm-hmm. Um, and so they were able to give that to to preemies. Um, and so that that felt really like a really wonderful values centered mission that I was able to contribute to on the back end. Yeah. And I would highly recommend milk donation. Um, it was a great experience. Everybody at at the milk bank is fantastic. They are so positive and so supportive. 
be sure to share the link to yours and we'll put it on your show notes page. Absolutely. Great. All right. So let's hear about your second pregnancy and how that went. Sure. Getting pregnant with my second baby, we actually ended up um, doing so a little earlier than we were planning to because the way I I say this tongue in cheek is I turned 37 and I heard the clock ticking. Um, And so we were initially going to have our kids four years apart. um, But when Charlotte was two and I had just turned 37, uh, it just, it just became apparent to me. I definitely wanted to have a second kid. We definitely wanted to have a second kid and it's not a sure thing. And particularly with that early scare that we had had with the prenatal testing with her, even though it turned out to be a false positive, um, I just didn't want to take any chances and I wanted to, to just move forward with it. Um, and so I got my IUD out and I got pregnant the first cycle after my IUD was out. (laughs) And so we did not expect it to be that quickly, but based on what I had learned about tracking and using ovulation, uh, predictor strips and, and things like that, I knew what I was doing and got pregnant the first cycle after the IUD was out. So that was, um, wonderful and unexpected, but, uh, you know, a definitely a blessing that we are appreciative of because I knew what it felt like to feel that early pregnancy woozy feeling. Mm -hmm. Um, I actually woke up woozy, like with that, just the early pregnancy feeling, just feeling off is the best way to describe it. Um, at eight days post ovulation and I got my first positive at 11 days post ovulation. And by that point I had had a couple of those mornings of feeling woozy. And so it wasn't even a surprise. It was just like, yep, that's what I thought. (laughs) Um, and it was just confirmation for what I already felt like I knew. So Madeline's pregnancy, because I had had the, um, a preemie, it was high risk right to the start, right from the start. And I had already been hooked up with a great maternal fetal medicine practice from before. And so I went back to them. Um, I had gestational diabetes again, and it was identified earlier than it was initially. I eventually had to have both uh, metformin as well as uh, eventually insulin. And my requirements for medication to manage the gestational diabetes just kind of um, kept getting more and more as the pregnancy advanced. So at first it was just metformin, and then I needed um, slow-acting insulin to control fasting numbers, and then I needed fast-acting insulin after meals. And being a detail-oriented person who loves science and data, uh, gestational diabetes actually fit me really well (laughs) because I took meticulous notes about what my blood sugars were and what I had eaten to get particular numbers. And by the end of my pregnancy, I had like two things I could have for breakfast (laughs) that I knew work, but it worked with my type A personality. So I took um, meticulous notes. I actually ended up uh, losing a fair amount of weight, just kind of accidentally. It's it's funny. Um, it's funny to think about losing weight accidentally, but I, I wasn't trying to, but just as a side effect of ge- keeping my, my blood sugar under control and I was still exercising throughout because that, that helps control blood sugar as well. I lost weight. So gestational diabetes was a whole thing. And then I was also on baby aspirin to prevent preeclampsia, which I was at risk for. Um, I was on um, probiotics to just keep all the flora healthy and, and, um, keep away any like, uh, infections or yeast infection or anything. And then I was on McKenna progesterone shots from 16 to 30 weeks. And my husband did these at home. We did the first one in the office and he learned how to do it. And then we did the subsequent ones at home and we learned it's a very big needle and it has to go in your buttocks. And so in like the muscle of your, of your buttocks. And so we learned that I I needed to ice thoroughly before the shot for about five to 10 minutes. And so I would just lay on the bed with an ice pack on my behind and then he, he would do it. And you can't even do it quickly because the medicine is kind of like thick and like almost oily. So you can't even like just give the shot quickly and take it out. It you like, it takes a few seconds to push it all in. And so he learned to do it as quickly as he could. And then I would ice for another five minutes or so afterwards. And that was the best way to do the progesterone shots. I do have one tip for anybody on progesterone shots. This was now three and a half, four years ago, but I got 
thanks to the suggestion of the maternal fetal medicine office, they hooked me up with what was called at the time McKenna Care Connection. And basically what they do is they call you and they help you agree to an out-of-pocket amount that you can afford and they bill insurance. And reading between the lines of how this works, and once I saw the statements that went to my insurance for each shot, um, each shot was, I believe, about $3,000. I wasn't paying $3,000. I was paying, I think my out-of-pocket amount for each shot was 100 But that was an amount I had negotiated with them and they had said was okay. And then they billed the insurance $3,000 a shot. Once you start these shots at 16 weeks, you cannot stop them. It is it is riskier to start them and stop them than it is to just not do them at all. Mm. And so reading between the lines of how healthcare works, I'm pretty sure why they do this is they know if they get you on the hook and they bill your insurance $3,000 a shot, they're going to get a lot of money and they'll let you basically pay... <laughs> whatever you agree to. So I I wished I had tossed out a lower amount. It it kind of felt like I could pay this. And they're like, sure. (laughs) Like, what if I had said $5 a shot? Would they have agreed to that? I don't know. But that is a perverse way that our medical system works. But if you're lucky enough to be somebody with insurance, and I'm lucky enough to have a really good insurance plan, I wanted other people to know that. Yeah. I mean, it certainly doesn't seem ethical to me, but that is how they appear to work. Yeah, I appreciate you sharing that because I feel like we always talk about advocating during birth, but there are definitely things like that that come up during pregnancy and you just like have to ask all the questions all the time, not only about your health, but about financial stuff. And, you know, it's funny you say that, Bryn, because that that was my next point that I wanted to talk about, um, advocating for myself. I'm a professor. I'm a scientist. uh, I have access to empirical literature. And you can bet I did a bunch of research myself and and looking at at primary empirical literature to the point that I was correcting the doctors about ACOG recommendations or or whatever. And that is definitely something I learned. I, I, am a, I recognize I'm a particular type of patient. Doctors either really like working with a patient like me who is very informed and wants to be very involved in their care, or they really hate patients like me. But I was lucky to, enough to have a good match with my providers who, who appreciated my need to know and advocate for myself. Or, or if they were annoyed by it, they did not show that they were annoyed by it. <laughs> um, and so one of the ways that I learned to advocate for myself was um, I ended up having a continuous glucose monitor by the end of my pregnancy. And so by the third trimester, I did twice weekly non-stress tests and ultrasounds and as you commonly find with gestational diabetes babies, her um, I had high fluid and her belly was measuring large. And if you looked at my blood sugar numbers, they were I had to be on insulin for them, but with insulin and eating the way that I knew I needed to eat and exercising and everything, everything was perfect. And so it was unclear like where why is her belly big and why do I have excess fluid if my gestational diabetes looks controlled on paper. And so that was enough to be able to get a continuous glucose monitor. And once I got on a continuous glucose monitor that takes, it basically takes your your blood sugar every five minutes over a 24-hour period. Um, And again, for somebody who loves data, super cool and interesting, Um, but it revealed basically later spikes. It revealed that my blood sugar was spiking sometimes after I took my one-hour meal number. And so I would eat and then take my blood sugar an hour later and think it was fine. And then the continuous monitor was picking up later spikes. Um, and so, you know, so I would be spiking like as I'm sleeping and don't even realize it or like spiking like, you know, between meals and I don't even realize it. Um, and so once I could see that with the continuous monitor, you can't treat what you can't see. And so once I could see that, I got it right in line and the fluid went to to a normal level and her belly was big. That was an accurate measurement. Photos of her as a baby, she has this like egg shape almost um, with her belly. So that was accurate, but I was able to get the fluid down and get my blood sugar numbers in line by the end. All right. Um, anything else from this pregnancy you want to share before we get into the birth? I guess a funny thing with working with maternal fetal medicine so much, by my third trimester, when I called the office, the staff knew both my name and my date of birth by my voice. Oh my God. <laughs> so I would call and say, hi. And they'd say, you know, my, my name and my date of birth. And I'm like, yep, that's me. Anyway, just a, a f- funny MFM anecdote. <laughs> 
Oh, and actually, I do want to mention also, I took a mindful birth class, but I found out about the mindful birth book on your podcast, actually, and um, got it on audiobook early in my pregnancy, and then had actually looked up a mindful birthing class that was really wonderful. I did it with Mindful Birth and Parenting Philadelphia. And um, I went to it in person, but now in the era of COVID, they're offering online classes that are accessible to anybody. And I would really highly recommend Mindful Birth and Parenting Philadelphia specifically, but the Mindful Birth book more broadly, as well as just mindful approaches to birth. Awesome. Well, I'm excited to hear how that plays in with your birth story. So let's go ahead and talk about um, how labor started this time. Sure. So at 37 weeks, uh, I switched modes from I want to keep this baby in and not have a preterm baby to I want to get the baby out. Yes. Because being being a medication controlled person with gestational diabetes, um, they were quote going to let me go all all the way up to 39 weeks and six days, but not any further than that. And so they start they started talking about induction like weeks before my due date, and. Um, again, on the having the sense that medical providers are not listening to me, I kept saying, I don't think I'm going to have to be induced. I had a preterm baby. <laughs> like, I think it's going to be fine. Um, and I just, you know, women know their bodies and medical staff doesn't. But at 37 weeks, I switched modes from keep the baby in to get the baby out. And I gradually started doing more as 38 weeks approach. So I started drinking tea. And um, after 38 weeks, I started um, using the breast pump for a couple of minutes. And I knew this was working at um, a couple days before 38 weeks when I started losing pieces of the of my mucus plug. Um, and so that, that ended up being five days before birth. And we had a funny situation where my uh, husband had a big deadline within 24 hours. Um, and, I, and I started losing pieces of the plug. And And so that was a stressful 24 hours of like, all right, get your deadline done because like we think the baby's coming. Um, And so especially once that deadline was done, I felt I was like, okay, great. His deadline is done. I'm full term. Let's do this. Let's make this happen. Um, And that whole week leading up to her birth, even my my doctors commented on the change in my demeanor. Uh, I was just like, yep, this is going to happen. We've got it under control. I'm not worried. Let's do this. Um, and so I felt really calm and centered as I went into her birth. I was bouncing on the yoga ball, doing prenatal yoga stretches, walking a lot. Uh, I had been doing pelvic physical therapy. I really credit this for knowing my body so well. And I also started to get very tired leading up to her birth. So I, I am not a napper, but in, in the days leading up to Madeline's birth, I took two naps per day. Um, so uh, definitely my body knew that something was happening. Yeah, that's a good indicator for sure. <laughs> One TMI detail, uh, though there's no TMI in the birth hour, is um, to get labor going. As I, you know, I knew we were heading in that direction. Is you know, I knew, um, you know, being intimate with one's husband is is one thing that can propel labor. And so we did that. It has prostaglandins in it that ripen the cervix. Uh, semen does, and so that definitely worked to get labor started. And then one thing that I did is I actually put in a menstrual cup afterwards so that it kept all the prostaglandins in right up next to the cervix. Oh, I don't think I've heard that one before. (laughs) This was a method I invented. I don't know that anybody else has done this. I'm sure if my doctors knew I did this, they would be horrified. (laughs) But again, I was trying to avoid induction. Right. And one detail I didn't didn't say about getting pregnant is I actually did that both times getting pregnant as well. Yeah, I've heard about it then. Yeah, and I've heard it about it on your your podcast also, like even for lesbian couples. Right, it was like an IUI or something. Right. I heard one birth story where their donor just gave them the donation in a menstrual cup. Mm. And so it turns out that works for heterosexual couples as well. What gets the baby in gets the baby out. (laughs) So just a tip. (laughs) Yeah. If you can make it happen, it definitely can help. (laughs) Right. So on the day of of Madeline's birth, I woke up at 5 a.m. just like I had done with Charlotte. And I I noticed I was having just little cramps eight to 10 minutes apart. And uh, I had an OB appointment that morning anyway. And I had planned to help them to have them strip my membranes. Um, didn't end up being necessary because I went into my appointment and and the doctor went, oh, you're uh, five to six centimeters dilated right now. Um, and so I was five to six centimeters dilated with very mild contractions, you know, that like I could see on the NST strip, but were completely manageable. Like they felt like menstrual cramps. They were not hard at all. 
so I went out of that appointment going, oh, wow, okay, all right, I'm five, five and a half centimeters dilated right now, and like I don't really even feel like I'm in labor. All right, this is going to go pretty quick, <laughs> hopefully. Um, and so I went home to rest. I was re- very thankful for my doctor's office in not wanting to admit me right away, right then. But they said, you know, go home to rest, you know, come to labor and delivery later today. Um, and so I went home to rest. I had lunch with my daughter who was in our nanny share at the time and we put her down for a nap. And then I had an experience I've heard about on your podcast. Um, otherwise where once I knew that my almost three-year-old was safe and we had arrangements for her labor immediately ramped up, like within minutes, within minutes, my contractions went to like a little crampy to, I have to breathe and walk through them. It was dramatic. Um, And so that's just the power of the mind-body connection. Once I knew my first baby was safe, my body knew that I I could have my second baby. All right. So then how did it progress from there? So I went to the hospital by about 3 p.m., which was earlier than I intended. But um, like I said, labor ramped up really quickly. And so all of a sudden, my contractions were two to three minutes apart. I was having to walk through them. And um, I actually labored in the lobby for about half an hour ahead of time because I was close to the labor and delivery unit and close to medical attention, but I was, I was handling it. I didn't, you know, I didn't feel like I needed anything from the medical staff yet. I, you know, I was walking, I was swaying, I was breathing through contractions. Um, I was having a snack. I knew they wouldn't let me continue to have my snack when I went upstairs. And so that actually, it's silly because we have these photos, birth photos of like laboring right outside the gift shop that look kind of funny, but it was great. I, I was close and I was safe and I, and I was doing my own thing. Um, and so I was admitted to the hospital at about four o'clock. Um, and when I was admitted, I was eight to nine centimeters dilated, hundred percent of face and plus one station with a bulging bag of water. And so at four o'clock, we're like, all right, this is going to be pretty quick. Maybe um, it was not as quick as we thought it was going to be. My doula came and my doula was um, was wonderful, helping me do prenatal yoga poses. She, I loved the counter pressure on my back that she would do during a contraction. Um, I loved uh, laboring, um, laying over the birthing ball. Um, I loved swaying through contractions. I really used the mindful birth techniques of breathing through contractions. And when I felt something intense or I felt you know worry or anxiety, just going back to paying attention to my breathing. And it was, it was great. Like it was, I I really had my dream birth for my, for my second baby. Um, the medical staff paid attention to me and they, um, took care of me and they got the measurements that they needed for blood sugar and fetal monitoring and everything. They did not have to intervene in any way. And so, by about 6.20, I went through transition, and I knew I knew I was um, doing that because I, I started vomiting, um, and I hate, I hate getting sick, and so that was, that was not fun, but that's what birth is. Um, right after that, I felt uh, pressure, and I, felt, I said I felt pushy. Um, my water had still not broken by that point, and so I agreed to them breaking my water, and right after my water broke, things, again, moved pretty quickly. Right after my water broke, I, I had been standing up a lot and swaying and being pretty active throughout birth. But after my water broke, I really just wanted to be um, supported. And so I, I laid down and I rolled to my left side and uh, I felt contractions in this last half hour of birth. I felt contractions in three phases very distinctly. I felt between contractions, I was relaxing and I knew how to completely relax my muscles thanks to mindfulness and pelvic physical therapy. And so I could feel myself relaxing and then I could feel the contraction and then I voluntarily pushed. And so I felt, I felt in that like relax, contract, push. And I felt three levels like that. And contractions were very strong. They were involuntary. They were taking over. And so I pushed for about 15 minutes. And then the nurse said, can you pant through this next contraction? I'm going to go get the doctor. <laughs> and uh, and I, I looked, I remember I looked up at my doula with this WTF look in my eyes <laughs> of like, why is she having me stop pushing? And my doula bent down and whispered in me, you're a good pusher. <laughs> They're surprised. <laughs> you know, they, this is going faster than they thought it was going to. <laughs> so I panted through one contraction. 
the doctor came in, I pushed two times and Madeline was out. And so very smooth. It was, uh, I, I wrote down the times. 6.55 was when they asked me to pant through the contraction and 7.02 was when she was born. They had talked to me a lot, again, about the um, high fluid and her belly being big and the possibility of shoulder dystocia with gestational diabetes babies. And I had read a lot about this and had gone into it saying, I don't think that's going to happen. I don't think I tend to have big babies, but whatever happens, you guys will handle it. You're excellent medical staff. You'll figure it out. And my retribution in paying attention to myself and knowing my own body was that not only did she not have shoulder dystocia, she came out in one push. She came out all at a time. Like the doctor did not have to rotate her to like deliver the shoulders. She just came out in one push. That's amazing. Her sister might have paved the way a little bit, although she came out quickly too. Right. So I have learned that we are stopping at two babies. We're having no more babies, but I have learned from my two births. Once my water breaks, I have a baby in like half an hour. Mm -hmm. (laughs) (laughs) So that's my body. So she was born in two pushes and my husband got to cut the cord. I wished I had waited for the placenta to be delivered, for the cord to be cut. I think my my doctor and the the medical staff would have been fine with that. Um, But... We didn't think of it at the time. So uh, delivered the placenta about 20 minutes later, and I felt great. I had I had that the golden two hours actually, which had been really important to me after having a preemie, um, and missing that time just cuddling with my baby right after birth. But I had it with my second, and it was it was so great. And um, she was so cuddly and warm and just wonderful, and she smelled so good, and it was just lovely. And it was exactly the redemptive birth that I needed and wanted after um, after having a preterm baby. Amazing. And then how was your postpartum, I guess, both immediate? Because it was probably very different than having a baby in the NICU. And then also once you went home and had a toddler at home and everything. It was definitely different. Um, but I, I knew, you know so much more with your second baby. Mm-hmm. And so um, Madeline was actually born at almost the exact same gestational age that Charlotte came home. Mm. And um, their behavior was very similar. <laughs> Madeline was a little bit sleepy. And again, that that seemed similar to me from having a late preterm baby before. She was a little sleepy. Um, my milk lagged coming in because she was just sleepy and not stimulating me as much. I did have a little scary time in the couple days after birth where she had lost 10% of her weight by day three and my milk wasn't in as much as, as it really needed to be. Um, but because I was a second time mom and because I knew so much about nursing and breastfeeding and I knew lactation consultants I could call and I knew La Leche leaders I could call and I had all kinds of friends who had had babies and I had my support system. I knew exactly where to go to get help. I say we we went into NICU mode. I knew like, okay, pump every two to three hours. I've had my pumping bra set up. My husband knows to bottle feed what I've just pumped while I'm pumping. And, you know, we, we had a system down. And so I pretty quickly got her over that hump. Um, we ended up switching pediatricians because I didn't like how my pediatrician handled that moment in her losing 10% of her weight. And I had this very clear moment of insight of this is what happens if I didn't know what to do and where to get help. This is where people's breastfeeding journeys diverge. And I did not think that my pediatrician was handling that situation appropriately. So we switched pediatricians. Again, postpartum rage is one of my... (laughs) One of my symptoms. I think that's also a second time mom thing. Like you just know those mom instincts kick in and you're like, nope, got to find the right fit. Yeah. I was proud of myself though. We booked another appointment with that pediatrician where I told him what I thought. Nice. I told him exactly that. This is this is where women's breastfeeding journeys diverge because of the kinds of things you said. Mm. And we like our other pediatrician much better. Good. We had some challenges with the sibling transition for Charlotte. Mm-hmm. I struggled with a lot of just kind of mood regulation and anger at her over kind of this this mix of like feelings of protectiveness of my baby, nice. but also loving my first baby, but also feeling so incredibly angry at her for, you know, being rough with the baby or something. Mm-hmm. And um, that was that was really tough. I will give a plug for, again, mindfulness. I had been seeing a therapist off and on for a couple of years before this anyway. I was so glad I had already been hooked up with a therapist because she was able to to 
recognize signs of oncoming postpartum depression um, and intervene before it got too bad. And she's wonderful. And she uses specifically mindfulness techniques and specifically um, dialectical behavior therapy, DBT therapy, which has a lot of a mindfulness component, but I really benefited and continue to benefit a lot from my therapist and from DBT therapy specifically. Nice. All right. Well, we're kind of here at the end. Did you have any resources that you want to share? Yes. I would highly recommend um, both of Emily Oster's books, Expecting Better and Crib Sheet. Um, And I think she has a a third one coming out soon, actually, Mm -hmm. about uh, early childhood. And I would also recommend Taking Charge of Your Fertility, the book. I learned about charting from that. Um, I would recommend Mindful Birthing. That's by Nancy Bardicke, um, as well as any sort of mindful birthing class. And again, Mindful Birth and Parenting Philadelphia. La Leche League has been extremely helpful to me. And especially when I had a NICU baby, the Simple Wishes pumping bra was a savior so that I could pump and do other things, you know, pump and and pay attention to my baby, pump and write emails, you know, pump and, you know, do any anything else. I, I loved the Simple Wishes pumping bra. It was it was really a game changer. I would also recommend our birth photographer. We had a wonderful birth photographer. Her name is um, Anne-Marie Hamant. She currently is in the Lehigh Valley area of Pennsylvania, but I believe will be moving to Delaware soon. And she was she's fantastic. She's become a personal friend um, who's taken pictures of our, our family several times. And my birth was one of the first she had done as a, as a birth photographer. And she's kind of gotten bitten by the birth bug uh, for, for taking pictures of, of birth stories. All right. Well, thank you so much for sharing those resources. We'll be sure to link to all of those from the show notes page. And I know people are going to be able to leave comments on your show notes as well to connect. Do you have any final words of wisdom or thoughts to share with listeners? Sure. So I have both micro small lessons learned as well as macro ones. My small lessons learned are follow your baby, but also lead and kind of find that balance between following your baby, but also knowing as a parent what you need to provide for your baby. It was immensely helpful to learn about sleep and newborn sleep. I learned that in the moment, but I wished I had learned that ahead of time. And so many people in your podcast speak to this, but finding friends with similarly aged babies, either via social media or locally or both. And then my big picture lessons learned would be educate yourself and advocate for yourself. I also am a big believer in values-based decision-making and identify what's important to you. You know, if you had to boil it down to, you know, the top three things that are important to you in your birth, what would those be? I definitely found it's not so much the, you know, do I have delayed cord clamping or not, but it's more about how you feel. Do you feel respected? Do you feel like you have autonomy? Do you feel like people are hearing you? Related to that is surround yourself with supportive people. And I really think if you feel heard and supported and are making your decisions in a values-based way, lots of different births, no matter how they happen specifically, can feel empowering and wonderful. I love that. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to share your stories today. And again, people can connect with you over on the show notes page. Thank you for having me. Now I'm going to chat with Ashley about Baby List, today's sponsor. Hi, Ashley. Thanks for coming on the podcast today to chat with me about Baby List. Hi, Bryn. Thanks for having me. Can you tell listeners a little bit about you? Yes. Uh, so my name is Ashley. I have one son, Jasper, who's 14 months old, and I work from home. I run a, a podcast about Waldorf education called Waldorfy. Very cool. Um, did you do Waldorf teaching before having your son or just I didn't about? actually. I was a Waldorf student. I went to oh. Waldorf school uh, grades one through eight and my husband actually went K through 12. So uh, we had a lot of experience. We went back to a parent and child class and parents were really interested in what we had to say about our experience. And that's how the idea got started. That's awesome. All right. So baby list, how did you first find baby list and get started using it? Well, I found out about Babyless because I was listening to your podcast and heard an ad for it. Mm -hmm. As so many of the ads on your podcast, I followed through with going and looking into them. So I found Babylist through you. Then I set up a Babylist account when I was pregnant, probably when I was four or five months pregnant because I traveled quite a bit when I was pregnant and I wanted to set up my registry early. And one of the features that attracted me to Babylist so much is that it allows you to collect items from all over the place kind of on the internet. And I wanted time to be able to really research and really choose uh, which place I wanted to 
you know, be getting items from. So I set it up nice and early. Like I said, I was probably maybe five months, four or five, six months pregnant. And that's how I got started in setting it up. I bet being a Waldorf kid, you had a lot of handmade items is my guess. Yes, I did. Um, So I have a really big interest in natural items, Mm -hmm. uh, wooden toys, you know, Mm -hmm. anything that was organic cotton, I was obviously really interested in. And also items that were, I guess, produced ecologically responsibly, Mm -hmm. if that's a way to describe it. Um, So that was a big thing for me. I didn't, it really did not attract me to be going into like a big box store and just clicking a bunch of items because they had them. I really wanted to, I had a lot of items from Etsy that I was Mm -hmm. interested in, um, from small craftsmen people. And... Mm -hmm. You know, like I mentioned, natural materials. Um, I had a beautiful Moses basket that I found that, you know, you definitely couldn't get at a big box store. So, yeah, that was obviously the feature that definitely attracted me the most was I had some really unique items that I knew that the only way my friends, family, especially my aunts who definitely like were not in the loop outside of the big box stores (laughs) were never going to be able to find on their own. And Babyless just made it so easy for them. Yeah. So did you mostly use it on your phone since you said you were traveling or on your computer? I used both. So I set it up on my desktop and Mm -hmm. it could not have been more easy. That's one of the features that I loved about it so much. I mean, it took like obviously less than, I don't know, five minutes to set up. Even my husband who really didn't do a lot of the baby planning things used it a little bit. (laughs) Um, And the way that it works, you can set up a little button on your like toolbar. So anytime you're looking at baby items on the web, you can just click add to baby list in your toolbar and it kind of adds the item right into your baby list, uh, list of items. And that was fantastic. I mean, I just could see something even, you know, be late in the evening or at night on my computer and say, Oh wow, I really like that. I could just add it right away. So Mm -hmm. I started off on my desktop, but like you said, I was traveling a lot and, uh, then I did use the mobile app as well. And that was great. Yeah, it's very much like Pinterest with the little button on your browser. And then what I love is once you click it, the little window pops up that allows you to like choose colors and adjust the price if you need to and things like that. Yeah, definitely. I had some items like I wanted all these cloth diaper covers and I wanted them, uh, a friend recommended getting items, not just like in the newborn size, but all the way going, going up. Mm -hmm. So I added like six colors in the first size and then like next five colors in the next size up. And each item listed, it kind of came up as an individual um, item in size. And then I could show, you get to kind of even decide the image that you want to display. So that Mm -hmm. kind of helped me to get to guide people towards, you know, which one, which ones we wanted. And that was really helpful. It just allows you to be so specific in what you're asking for, which people really like. I mean, I know when I'm getting a gift for somebody, I love knowing that it's exactly what they're wanting. And I was so my, so my mom and my sister threw a baby shower for me and I loved all of the items I got. I told my dad the night before I was like, Oh, I'm so nervous. I'm going to get some like, I don't know, big, huge thing for baby or not, or some item that I'm just going to like have to donate like right away that I'll never use for baby. And all of my, my sisters and my mom, they did such a good job of, you know, directing everybody to baby list. It was so easy. And I only got items I really loved. I didn't have to return or donate anything. (laughs) That is rare. (laughs) Yeah. Awesome. I'm so glad it worked out for you and I appreciate you sharing your experience. Yeah, of course. Thank you so much again to Lauren for sharing her birth stories with us and to Babyless for sponsoring this episode. If you want more information from today's episode, you can head over to thebirthhour.com and search for Lauren's name in the search bar to find her show notes page. And then if you want to check out Babyless, you can find it in the app store on your phone or by going to babyless.com. I also highly recommend following Babyless on Instagram because they post all of the best um, sales and recalls and just keep you up to date on all things baby talk. Toddler, and even into the preschool ages, I still find things for our two and a half year old all the time. So again, they're just baby list on all social media as well. Thanks so much for listening. If you enjoyed today's show, head to thebirthhour.com and click become a member to pledge your support. And as a thank you, you'll get an invitation to join our private Facebook group and access to exclusive episodes. Your vote of confidence and support means the world to me.